So Marco, you're best known, um, I think, uh, in, particularly in the HEMA community. Um, unlike some people, I suppose, who make um, swords have come into it from making reenactment swords or making other types of you're you're a sort of specialist HEMA sword maker. Yes. Um, and you came into it through HEMA yourself, I suppose. Yes, basically it's been the opposite path. First I started fencing. Right. But I had uh, my father's workshop in a welder at my disposal. So I started making a few bits for the hills for myself, then for guys in the club, and slowly turned into sort of a second job. Yeah. And then I decided that, you know, I like that, <laughs> wanted to give it a try. And when I was almost 30, I decided just to switch career yeah. and give it a go. Turned out quite well. So you were in Italy then? Oh yes. Yeah. I was back in Italy, um, training with Francesco, look at that. Oh, cool. And then I moved to Scotland to work with Paul MacDonald yeah. for a couple of years. That's where I got my funny accent. <laughs> I learned English in Scotland. <laughs> and yeah, after that it was time to go by myself. And as you well see, it, I started with Brapier because it was the weapon and, and you know, I knew best yeah. as, a, as a fencer. So if you want to try to make good replicas that are close to the regionals, you need to know how sort of has to behave and I started with that and then I tried to expand my horizon uh, as, an, as a fencer and just to learn how to make better swords and slowly fills up all the gaps but mm. I'm still mostly yeah, known for my previous. So your very first work um, and obviously as a maker your, your skills develop uh, over time but the very first things you did were they things for yourself were you oh. changing were you taking swords that you bought from, I was, from someone else oh, and then adapting them? Or? I was basically working mostly on the hills because I wasn't that ready to make blades or to do heat treatment. I still didn't have that knowledge. So mostly I started buying uh, blades from, from their team. Uh -huh. It was like 15 years ago, it was basically just him yeah. and making custom hills on that. And then, uh, you know, made a few attempts at making blades when I realized that they were coming out from my point of view now, they were horrible, but <laughs> back then they looked awesome and perfect. You know? <laughs> and that's when I decided that it was good enough to try and I give it a go. And mm. that's when I moved to Paul. So when you, so when you started making hilts, you were taking Delta blades and making hilts from scratch? Oh yes, yeah? yes. And so what were you using as a model? Were you working from books or did you get in to look at some originals? Oh, that has been the approach that everyone has at the beginning is more fantasy oriented. Yeah. Uh, I didn't start as an historian. I started to be like, oh, that looks cool. I want to yeah. do that. And trying to make bits and pieces of different swords and whatever I liked and trying to match it together. And then slowly you realize that they already made the best combination of design and function. And those are the originals. There is not that much to improve. And a lot of, particularly in the kind of rapier in the 16th, 17th century, oh, yes. a lot of them were quite fantasy oh, already, because yes, they yes. had their own version of fantasy. Exactly, and then you realise that there is not much to improve on the design. You can just choose, you know, some details, yeah. and maybe combine a little bit of that, which is still what I do. I just um, respect all the canons of original swords. I may just get some license to, I don't know, use queens from a model and, uh, I don't know, uh, rings from another. Mm. Um, it's all taking parts from originals and trying to still maintain the styling and general shape yeah. of, of the originals. Or straight up copies. Yeah. But back then it was more like, you know, ideas of like... Bringing your, things, your, yes. your design to the, yes. yeah. So more of an artist's um, kind of approach, actually. Yes. Yes, and then I developed more and started studying more because it wasn't in my head to play with swords until I was 25, 26. Oh, so really? Yes. Yeah. So that's when you started HEMA? Yes. So what drew you, at that age, what drew you to oh, it's enough. It was completely random. A friend of mine asked me, like, oh, I saw this guy making a demonstration. Shall we go and have a go? All right. Yeah, and it was... Had you ever done modern fencing or... No, absolutely or? nothing. Nothing really? before that. But you were interested in maybe what were you interested in movies of that oh yes of course yeah. of course that has always been a part of it but uh never thought about actually doing it you yeah. know it's one of those things like oh would be so cool to believe we sort but yeah also as i say 15 years ago hema wasn't this big there were not that many clubs and yeah uh, 
So you started with Francesco. Yes. Um, so well, Francesco, Francesco was still back in Fieses. Ah, right, okay. I, I don't know the history of it. I know the com- I know it's, it's quite complicated politics history. Invention. We never stopped, <laughs> we still do it. I know in Italy um, it's quite complicated how all the different clubs relate to each other. Oh, yes, at some point they were all like the same club. Yeah. But they yeah. kept fighting with each other and <laughs> forming new and new Very club. Italian kind yes. of Renaissance. Um, and so Francesco obviously is a famous rapier um, yes. fencer and a very top level, fantastic um, rapierist. Um, and so, therefore, I suppose if you went to study with him, rapier was the thing that you were taught. Was it, so, did you make a choice at some point that rapier is what you wanted to focus on, or was it because that's what the club that you went to focused uh, on? Francesco Patton, despite the fact that the main focus was on rapier, he still had classes also on um, um, two handed, no, long swords and, and, and side swords on the side. And I went there with the idea, like any. D&D player with the idea of like playing with long swords and mm. I gave it a go but then I tried the rapier and it was like no no mm. I want to learn that I found it um, a lot more challenging is from my personal point of view I find the rapier that you need to find a uh, solution um, I find long sword playing checkers and rapier to play chess Right, okay. And so I, you know, I've obviously seen you fence and I've seen the types of rape, I've seen the rape you've made for yourself recently, which maybe we could talk about. But um, so it seems to me you're, what you're drawn to in rapier is you like cup hilts. Oh, uh, and yes. um, you like a lot of the quite, um, a lot of the point work, which obviously rapier is famous for, but yes. less, less of the, probably less of the cutting than some oh, yes. side sword, for yes. example. I'm you know, I'm studying mostly Capoferro as a right. as a main source. Um, I love sweat peels too, but I can't risk my hands. So okay, yeah, I, yeah. I only use cap peels because of that. Right, okay. I would love to get more period period, you know, attenant swords. Uh, but I I think it's very you, you can't really risk a thrust through the through the hills onto your hands when you do my job. Absolutely, yeah. That's I mean, I, I, so this is an interesting point, actually. So this is a slight tangent, but it fits in with this quite well. Yeah. What do you think? So I get asked this question a lot, and I'm not really sure. I've got some ideas, but I'm yeah. not exactly sure how to answer it. People say to me, given that cup hilts existed, why do people keep having swept hilts? Oh. <laughs> So my, so my theory, I tell, me, tell you my theory. So my theory is cup hilts are great um, against thrusting um, and they give a lot of good frontal protection, yes. but they don't give such good lateral protection against if someone's swinging a halberd at you, for example. Oh. Whereas with a swept hilt, you can have thick bars, very strong, and you can provide better side protection. So I think it's kind of weighing up specialisation against another rapier versus all better protection against lots of different weapons. No, no, that is a, probably the main point about that difference, exactly that. Um, especially sweat tilts usually may have lower bars to go mm. with the bottom half of your hand, mm. while with the cap hilt is usually just the knuckle guard, which yeah. does basically nothing for cuts. And if something comes at the side, yes, then that's you, hand gone. Your hand yeah. is there. Yeah. And as you say, it's perfect for that sort of cover. Also, uh, gripping the sword is different. Mm. Uh, if you prefer the you know, two fingers above the brilliant, cap mm. hilt is perfect. Your hand sits deeply into it. You've got more space, more room, and more cover. Mm. Uh, if you want to cut, you need just one finger above the brilliant because it's a lot better for you know swinging the than a cut. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And to do that, swept hilt helps. And usually they are, you know, shorter, lower uh, finger rings. Mm. So also the entire balance is shifted, is shifted slightly more towards the, you know, your wrist yeah. instead of the top of your fingers, which gives um, is a very long and complicated answer. But just to make it short, it changes the pivot point and makes the sword better for cutting. Right. It's a little bit more, um, you know. Um, flies a little bit faster for cuts instead yeah. of a cut build that tends to have the weight all distributed on top of your hand yeah, which yeah, yeah. makes the weight on your fingers a little bit harder which is perfect for bindings but it gets a little bit slower for cuts mm. and so something else i noticed again related to this is that a lot of people uh, a lot of modern rapiers made for hema for example and just bad replicas as well the rapier grips are very often longer than on the historical originals. Yes. And this is true of earlier medieval swords as well. So whether it's Viking era or 13th century, like, like yes. I-33 or 
or whether it's rapey period, modern people want longer grips because they feel more comfortable. Yes. But then they don't necessarily appreciate that they had short grips for specific reasons. Yes. No, no, absolutely. Uh, there you also encounter the problem about making swords for HEMA because people need to wear big gloves mm. and they're worried about breaking their hands. So, yes, an army sword, the grip has to be enormously bigger than the original because you need to fit big gloves in it. Unless you can have a glove somehow that accommodates the, the short grip. That, yes, I mean, but it's rare. It's difficult, yeah. yes. Especially if you want to use it in the tournaments, people go really hard, so you need that sort of protection. Yeah. Uh, weirdly enough, for rapiers, I don't know why they keep making such long grips, but it's also the opposite is, is wrong too. My new rapier, I made the first grip slightly shorter, with a slightly bigger pommel. It was pushing my hand too much into the cup. Okay. against the quillion. didn't like it, it was straining my arm, I had to just bring it back to the workshop, take it off, make it a, a, a slightly narrower, yeah. smaller pommel, so my hand can slide a little bit lower onto that. So, the results are too short. Yeah, I mean, I was, so I was going to, what are your thoughts about that? Because obviously if we look at uh, 19th century or indeed a modern foil, or epe, Yes. They have very long grips, yes, and there are the, some rapiers which have quite long yes, grips, but, but then that, that, some have short grips. Oh, but in that case, the pommel is really, really narrow. Yes, yeah. I have... Like it's kind of a little pair, isn't it? Or yes, or, it's yeah. literally, it's, it's right. almost usually even you know, a smaller diameter than the grip itself, so yeah. despite the fact that it sits longer on your wrist, mm. it still doesn't impede any movement. Mm. On a rapier, which is heavy, with a heavy blade, the pommel is bigger, mm. so it can't really sit here, because it may actually impede certain movements, or to be able to, you know, shift the grip in different guards, mm -hmm. like one is supposed to. And so it has to be just right. I actually just wrote a post on Facebook, you know, a few days ago, yes. asking about, like, how can people survive without a custom grip? Because it makes a whole lot of difference. I, I changed it, and suddenly no strain on my arm, I could get all the guards in no position I wanted, no problem at all. And the difference was like, half a centimetre of length and diameter. And if, uh, like drawing a contrast, so in, in the 17th century there was a, there's a certain type of English and Dutch rapier hilt which has quite a long handle, almost, oh, like, yes. the beginning of a, almost like the beginning of a foil grip, but then if we look at Spanish rapiers they've got very short grips and little pommels. Yes. Why do you think there's that difference between one, in one country you find a really short grip and another a longer grip, and yet they seem to be used in a similar-ish way? That is true. It really depends on um, the idea of the general concept of how you want to use the weapon. Mm -hmm. uh, the longer grip helps to keep it in line for lighter blades. And some of those Dutch and English rapiers, they start transitioning towards foil or mm -hmm. small sword. I mean, I mean, it could be to do with the stance as well. If the, if yes. the Spanish stance is very high up, maybe a long grip would get in the yes. way. Yes, especially you know the way that they want to dominate in certain position, mm -hmm. uh, you know, put the sword on top. You need to be able to make quick twists on your wrist. Yeah. Uh, the longer grip, which is then one that we kept using for early sport fencing, mm -hmm. Um, usually held lower in yes, more of a yes, exactly. Uh, it's not yeah. a problem, allow you a, not a very longer grip and it goes below the wrist, I yes, guess, and that exactly. from being in line with it. And exactly, like and yeah. you don't need to make certain movements. Everything works, but everything must be the right choice for your style. That's something that I struggle with because I've got tons of customers who want, like, I like the swords, but I study that, and it's like, you, yeah. you can't match yeah, it, yeah, yeah, it yeah. it's yeah. not going to work well for you. Yeah. And you, you need the right tool and it's not easy to make certain choices and you need to try, you need to know what you want. Yeah. Most people don't even know what they want. They Do we have any questions from the floor about rapiers while we're talking about rapiers? Not many rapiers here. No. <laughs> so, um, another thing that I know that you've spoken a bit about are uh, sharps and for, yes. a long, for a long time you've resisted the people's calls for sharp plays. Yes. Can you talk a bit more, more about that? Well, um, why were you reluctant and yeah, is well first of all, it's almost a, you know a different beast, you know, as a different sword. Seems like nothing, but uh, sharpening the blade and the edges and all that goes you know behind it uh, changes a lot the dynamics of the sword. Um, as a reference, weirdly enough, uh, sharp thrusting swords, sharp rapiers are heavier than the human ones. Mm. Uh, why? Uh, for cutting weapons, it's the opposite. Mm. Sharps are generally lighter. 
than yeah. the newer ones. Yeah. It's just a, a matter of stiffness. And yeah. So I have to be honest, actually, I think it, for me as a non rapierist but who occasionally dabbles in rapier, um, I, it's, I think it's a slight issue in, um, in HEMA in terms of how we, uh, how we judge and score rapier because rapiers are so diverse. Yes. And you know where one rapier might be very effective cutter, another rapier you look at some Spanish rapiers couldn't cut at all, uh, and no. some could could cut. Um, and so you know how we score different types of hits, and also you know that like you say the weight, um, the the weight range of rapiers can, is really quite huge. Yes. Um, and inevitably, if you've got a scoring system that favours essentially a hit of any kind, people are going to gravitate towards the longest, lightest weapon that they can get away with. Yes, and that's exactly <laughs> what is happening. Uh, that is actually happening for all the swords. Mm. They're getting lighter and lighter. And, and longer. <laughs> yes, longer and balance more, closer closer to your hands, so you don't need mechanics, you can make quick, you know, flicks out of your wrist. Same for long sword. Mm. And I mean, I feel, a bit, I feel a bit the same about hilts as well. You see, there's, there's more and more people using cut hilts even people who are doing styles of rapier where they probably would never have had cup hilts. Oh, no. Uh, but absolutely. they're taking a cup hilt because they're going, yeah, a cup hilt offers for tournament, for Hema tournament, offers great protection yes. against other rapiers. And it's one of the lightest hilts you can have. Yeah. You have a, so you have a big, light cup hilt, very long uh, cross guard. So essentially a Spanish hilt. Yes. But then with the longest, lightest blade you can oh, get. Yes. Uh, um, way lighter than any original. The problem is that people tend to hand pick whatever start they like. Oh, there are some regionals at 900 grams, and there were some regionals at uh, 45 inches blade. Yes, yeah. but they were not the same. Yeah. So, I mean, as you know, as comparison, the rapier that you made for me is 1300 grams, and yes. it's quite a beefy blade. It's a blade that oh, I would kind of think of as a military rapier. I know that's a, that's a problematic term yes. itself, but it's a, it's a cut and thrust sword. And I know that when I hit people with it, it hits quite hard. It hits oh, yes. as hard as an army yes. sword does. Um, and but when I'm up against someone who's got a blade of equal length but much lighter and quicker, um, yes. they can they can hit me quicker than I can hit them because yes. my sword's heavier and slower and I get more tired yes. more quickly. And so they have an advantage. And in scoring terms, they're scoring the same as I am. But oh, so it's difficult to. If you apply that to tournaments, uh, the best technique is really being. Discovered is what they do in sport fencing. Exactly, it's that FA, is the yeah. ultimate way to score points. <laughs> they really know it. It's FA with flip cuts. Yes, yeah. that is perfect. You can't beat that. We yeah. are just getting towards that, and it's just a matter of time. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it's important for us to also try and pull away from that as well, because if we're doing historical fencing and we're replicating historical swords, we want to yeah. think about what those swords do. The problem about using swords that are too light. I mean, I understand the fact that people want safety in theory, but allow people to do things that you couldn't possibly do with a real heavy sword. Mm. Uh, tendency in rapier is that lots of people in tournaments, they don't even lunge anymore, they poke, they just do this. Mm. And you can't really do it with something too heavy. Mm. And but it works, it's a great tool and yeah. it's a great technique to win a tournament. I mean in 19th century sources that I specialise in they specifically talk about this they go you're like yeah, yeah you're going to study foil and then you're going to study military sabre and it's really good to apply what you know from foil to sabre but there are some things they say categorically you can't do with a military sabre because it's too heavy oh, yeah. and you know they talk about the, 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 all of the complex circular, circular yes. parries and stuff and they say don't try it with a sabre, it's too clumsy, too heavy, and it'll get you killed. <laughs> yes. um, but if we were using sabres that were as light as a foil, like a modern sport fencing oh, sabre, yes. then yeah, you use it, you know, you oh, can yes, do of those course, forms, no problem so, at all. So it changes the dynamic of... Uh, yes, and it's changing towards that. Um, lighter blades are not that great for, you know, binds and blade engagements, so those yeah. are not happening at, at all. Yeah, there's not, yeah, there's not only advantages to being lighter, there are, like you say, there's some disadvantages to yes. being a lighter weapon, but overall, I think in a sporting context, the longer lighter weapon generally has an advantage. Yes, most... it's, it's very difficult to apply certain things. Also, the main issue about tournaments, from my point of view, as a maker, is that um, aggression helps to score more, to hit more. The, you know, the drawback is that you may die. Yeah. If you remove the dying part, yeah. but then have a no, go, be, no as, aggressive, be yeah. as aggressive as you want. That is the winning stance, the winning not tactic. Yeah. And to be really aggressive, you want a lighter sword that you can swing faster and move more quickly in the air. Mm. And it goes like that. And 
And we already know where he ends, from yeah. my point of view. I mean, we already that that process, you know, 150 years ago. But so, just moving on from rapiers a little bit, you have obviously branched then into side swords and oh, yes, basket health broadswords and all sorts of other anything basically long swords. Oh yes, yes. So what? Um, how how was that? How did you find that moving away from rapiers? What challenges did that bring moving to broader blades or longer blades? Um, weirdly enough, I, um, my theory is that most of um, no one-handed sword, uh, the blade is more or less the same mass. Mm. It's just distributed in a very different in way. In a different shape, yeah. Yes, they all range in the same uh, you know, amount of weight. Uh, it <clears throat> seems like people believe that a rapier blade is very long and thin, so it must be very light. Uh, my rapier blade alone is 600 grams, mm. which is the entire weight of a dueling sabre, yeah. you know, like Italian light dueling, yeah. or the total weight of a heavy small sword. Yeah. And an army sword is exactly the same weight. What changes, what people don't notice in the original is the thickness of the blade. Mm. Uh, Rapier get longer and a lot narrower, but they get a lot thicker to, to keep that, yes, yeah, to yeah. keep the exactly the stiffness on the blade. So I've been just trying to discover how to use that to my advantage, what to study different tapers. Rapier tend to be narrow, so that there is not really a taper on the blade, a shape, you know, the triangulation. And Long sword, Bolognese sword, you know, any cutting sword with a broader blade, that changes a lot the dynamic of the sword. Uh, where you remove weight, where you add it, uh, straight, wide tapers, they seem heavy because, you know, the, the base could be, the recastle could be quite wide, but the reality is that it brings the balance, the natural balance of the blade, so much back towards the hilt that you barely need the pommel. Yeah. So the extra weight that you put there actually you remove it from the pommel and the hilt. Right. It just gives a slightly different feel because the people point changes. And it's been weird because I had to move the focus on the, you know, balancing the sword from actually how do you want to use the hilt and the pommel to the blade itself. Mm. Bravery blades are more or less that. They vary very little. Mm. And so you use everything else. Right. As, as, a, as a way to, to get the, exactly the balance and the feel that the customer want. Kind of tuning it. Really. Yes. Yeah. While on a, on a broader cutting blade, you work more on the blade to get the same effect because it's the opposite. The, the That's hilt, most of the masses, yes. yeah. And the hilts are very simple, there is not much there going on, so you need to use the blade as the main sort of changing you know, dynamic. So if we take a couple of kind of extreme swords, like you, I've seen you've made a pretty broad Highland broadsword um, at one point, and, you, oh, and, yes. and you've obviously made montante and you know so I had the type things what are the challenges that come with making those types of blades oh <clears throat> well the main issue is that a broad single-handed sword they have to be very thin to, to work mm -hmm. people expect them to be stiffer than what they wear even the original are way more flexible than what we think of uh, I think that some of the Hema swords for broad swords are could be perfect sharps, mm. as they are with that f sort of flexibility. There is a beautiful illustration of a um, Highlander regiment, you know, uh, you know, sort of like putting his weight on his sword, yeah. like holding that, and with a nice, beautiful curve on the blade, yeah. and that's how they wear. Yeah. Uh, the main issue is to try to get that such a wide blade to be light enough on the tip, because yeah. it's a lot of weight, it's tons of weight, and when you start working on something that thin, a small mistake, you, oh, yeah. you just go like you know, half a mil too deep, you create a weak spot and yeah. it flexes only there and it's going to snap. And it's very complicated. While for the mon something like a Montante, the main issue is to keep it stiff enough mm. on such a long so blade. So it doesn't just flop. Yes, yeah. and it's also kind of a narrow blade for something that long mm. in, in proportion. And just keeping the weight down is really complicated because the rest is kind of simple, it's a simple construction, I mean, it's crucifer, crucifer swords are the easiest to make. Right. But when you, when you exaggerate the length like that, it um, could be complicated. Even the tang, it gets so long that if you don't shape it right, it flexes. Really? Yes. Oh, can, which could break the grip, I guess. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Usually the grip can sustain a little bit of flexing, but you don't want, you don't want it to be too much, mm. and you can definitely have that. 
people don't, you know, you, you, you can't really see it. If and you know Dave Rawlings is going to be swinging your uh, oh, yes. container, right? so they have to be strong. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's why when I usually make custom montante, I don't go any narrower than 8 mil thick. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it, you need that, that much strength. I almost think that's often a sign between, a very simplistic one, but between good replicas and bad replicas is how thick is the blade at the base. Yes. Um, because, you know, so many cheap Indian replicas are just... Not uh, yes. maybe half as thick as they should yes. be at the base of the blade. It's just that it's a lot more work to start with a thicker blade because yeah. that portion is going to be thicker, the rest is going to be the same, yeah. and you need to just have extra material to remove or to work on. So, so you literally you grind down, you get an eight millimeter thick bar and just grind all that. Yes, everything that is for him. Yes, because I need to have complete control of. So you stand for many hours just standing in front of the belt. Oh, not me and my apprentice. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the apprentice is for. Yes. In front of the belt sander, just not yes. moving. Wow. Actually, we, uh, I designed and built a machine just for that. Oh, really? Yes, oh. it's a lot faster than average. Cool. That's why we managed to keep prices low despite the right. hardened blades. So is it, is it um, a sanding thing? Is this yes. a secret? I don't want to ask if it's a secret. I, yeah, you know, it's still a, you know, a belt, a belt right. sander. Okay. It's just that it's designed in a certain way that oh. you know, allows us to do uh, hollow ground sections a lot more easily. Yeah. That's why most of my oh, right. sorts are hollow grounds. Well, it's actually the other way around. I wanted to make hollow ground sections because the problem about human swords is that you have an edge. Yeah. I mean, actually, you don't have it. You have yeah. a blunt edge, yeah. which is a lot of material. Yeah. So, so if you hollow grind it, it exactly. compensates. Yeah. Basically, what you remove from the diamond section, you, uh, you know, that, that material you add it on the edge, so you have a strong yeah. edge and a larger weapon. And with a nice central ridge that keeps the stiffness. Mm. And it, I find that that is the best compromise mm. between the two. That's really cool. So, um, what's um, currently? What are your favourite bits and least favourite bits of your oh, job? <laughs> right. Favourite bit is to work on uh, getting the right shapes of very complex hills like Escavona. Um There are so many different parts, and they all have to match one another to get exactly the shimmy that you want. That is where I love to focus. is is a challenge. It's not easy and I rarely see you know replicas made with the right shape in there that are you know that flow nicely. Mm. My least favourite things are sabers. Really? <laughs> Why is that? Uh, original sabers mostly were stamped and they were machine made and I have to do it by hand. So basically I'm using a you know Renaissance technique to make right. something that was more than and you can really see the struggle to try to do something that a machine could do a press even just the back strap is quite complicated to do it by hand yeah what for them yeah. was literally like boom done <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because some savers uh, obviously savers are my thing but yeah so a lot of 19th century savers have actually got quite complex um blade sections, the way that the blades oh, yes. change along, and actually more complex than a lot of Renaissance period swords. So it's funny because in a way people think sabers, late period, they're maybe simpler or oh, no, no, uh, the actually they're quite no, no, absolutely. sections. The blades are great, I'm mostly worrying on, on, the, on the hills. The yeah. hills were, you know, very easily made, mostly yeah. just to have, you know, mass production. Yeah, and some parts of cast and, yeah, yes. yeah, cast brass and, yeah. Exactly, well, I'm not doing that. You're not set up for that style of, uh, of yes. piece of piece. So in the end, basically, it takes me longer with yeah. modern tools to make a saber than... Yeah. Do you do any, any cast things? Do you uh, cast pommels or...? Um, only if they are very, very difficult to make right. or impossible to make. Right. Uh, usually I try to carve and engrave and do everything by hand, yeah. everything from, you know, from stock. And what about heat treatment? Because I think you changed how you do Yes, I just changed the type of forger I'm using. Um, I switched from a gas one, but basically for the first eight years of my, in my trade I've been just checking the collar. Yeah. To know when it was the you know the right temperature. Now I switched to an electric one, which are nice, with a nice dial. It's like yeah, right. like the oven with the bleed yes, back. Yes, exactly. It's <laughs> it's just that. So it's a lot. And what do you quench? Do you yes. quench by hand in oil? Yes. Point point down into a. Yes. Point down into yeah. a tank of oil. Right. Okay. And then what do you do? A file test and all flex and. Well, it depends on what. What it is for? Yeah. If it's for a humor sword, we mostly do a flex test, mm -hmm. and if it's for a sharp, 
we change a little bit the temperature, temperature of the oil when you quench it, just to get a little bit more HRC. Also for human swords, I try to use a, a steel that maybe not the toughest on the surface, okay, yeah. but allow you to take incredible bends. I mean, I got right. someone previous getting 100 so degrees. So tough, but not hard necessarily. Exactly. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's not soft. Yeah. Could, could be harder. But it's very good at taking. Yes, that's why they don't snap easily. Yeah. And uh, literally, I, I got pictures of a few guys with rabies getting 180 degrees bends and yeah. they're still using those blades. Do you use a different steel when you make a sharp? It depends on the sharp. Right, okay. But yes, yes and no. Sometimes yeah, it could okay. be the same, depends, sometimes yeah. yes. To be honest, the, the same steel is a good average of what original steel wear. Yeah. Um, Roberto Gotti made a beautiful study about uh, composition of regional swords. And oh, right. Yeah, they studied the composition of the carbon and of the steel itself. Yeah. It's not far. It said that for sharp people now in modern age expect something definitely stiffer, definitely harder than yeah. what they wear. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that certainly all the of analysis I've seen of original blades. Um, actually a lot of them were softer than yes. the modern people would they'd go this is too soft and it's like no. well in the 16th century they were happy with that yes um, and, and I think it's a, I think it's a different context of, of what people are expecting from a sword and, yeah um, that, that, using it for oh yeah that goes uh, a lot into what we do uh, not not just on the blades yes uh, sharp blades were a little bit softer both in the flex than in the actual hardness of the steel because people knew how to sharpen it mm. and they had to do it because if you were you know, in a campaign on the battlefield you had to be able to sharpen your own sword. Now it seems like if you ask a customer to sharpen his own sword it's a, you know, it's a sin and same problem goes with complex hills. Yeah. Most of the regionals were a lot thinner than ours. Yeah. I had that discussion about feathers and it wasn't just the fact of surviving for a long period, it's just that I believe that some regionals will last five minutes in a hymn about that's the main problem when it goes to complex hills I studied a few dusaks and you know German side swords and the, the walls they were like three mil thick tapering to basically an edge mm. if I made and it was cheap iron or cheap mine steel if I do something like that in a bar here it will last literally five minutes and it will just bend it yeah. so I need to find a way to make that thicker, tougher, without getting too much weight on it compared to the originals. Where I struggle is to keep the strength of what people want. Tangs are all bigger and thicker, because mm. they snap them. Mm. Some of the originals were very tiny. The idea was, if it saves you from the fight and you survive, yeah. great, bring it to the smith, have it fixed, and go back. You, you see it with everything. You see it with armour, you see it with shields. You know, replicas of shields are pretty much universally heavier, heavier oh, than, yes. than originals. Because like you say, you need it to function for that fight or for that battle. Yes. And then if it's trashed, well then you buy a new one. Yes. And <laughs> um, or you get it fixed. That's why they were carrying, you know, blacksmith with them on the on campaigns just yeah. to fix things. Because you don't want extra weight. Mm. You just need to last that five minutes or that hour in that battle. And... After that, get a new one or get it fixed or, you know, grab the one from the guy you killed. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But we know people want something that is the same weight as that, but it has to last forever, while a bashi that as hard as it can. That is the struggle of trying to make good replicas. And you need to find way around to take the weight out without compromising. So basically, you have to redesign the entire sword mm. to get the same balance and dynamics. Because you have to do it in different ways. So the hilt is heavier, which means that you need a lighter pommel, but that changes the pivot point. So you want to change how the blade is designed. Yeah. So you move everything back to an original, but now it doesn't, nothing is like the original. Yeah. Because yeah, you have edges, you have to change the thickness of the bars on the, on the hilt. Yeah. It feels the same in the end, but nothing matches that. I, I think it would be nice, actually, particularly with rapier, if, if more people had um, replicas made of the original practice rapiers. Because everybody wants, they want a blunt Hema rapier that looks like a sharp real rapier, rather than yes. looking at what were they using for practice. Oh, they had blunt nail-ended, oh, yes. you know, simplistic hilts. Well, that's when the word foil came out, yeah. actually. Yeah. And they were a lot similar to foil, you know, yeah. whether you yeah. saw a rectangular or, you know, a square section up to the nail tip. Uh, I may understand why people want the replica 
a blunt of a sharp. We don't get to use sharps. No, and it looks so, nicer. <laughs> yes, is. And we're doing this for a hobby. So oh, yes, if, if you think, you know, if your dream is about these beautiful rapiers you've seen in the Wallace collection or the Stibbett yes. collection, then you want, you know, you want something that looks oh, like no, that, I guess. It's the same thing with small sword, you know. Small swords, yes. historically, were just using figure of eight guard foils. Yes. But modern small swords want a hilt that looks like an actual yes. small sword. I have an Italian uh, Espada de Terreno, yeah. which, for which no foil was designed. Uh, Basically, there was the shard, mm. and the foil was the training version of that sword. I didn't make the foil, I made a blunt of version of the shard. Yeah, yeah. Because I wanted to have that sort of weight and balance, because I never get to use the actual yeah. shard. Yeah, yeah. While back then, you train with the foil when you're aspiring, but then you, you also train with the sharp ones by yourself. And you got to wear it all day. Exactly. <laughs> so you, you have both both feelings and it's the same problem we have here and lots of people talk about like tournaments that happened even back then yeah and there were again then too great yes but then they had to use the swords to actually fight for their lives so they had to do both we are you doing just one yeah so you can't really translate everything that was happening there to now we need to adapt both what we do and the swords we use because it doesn't translate because we don't have the actual killing people part. No. Well, I, I was going to say, isn't that sad? But it's not actually yeah. sad at all. <laughs> Do we have people. any uh, questions anyone would like to ask? When well, you were talking about the uh, early on rapiers and how they're, not, how they're different from the original ones, the mm. train ones, and actually when it comes to tournaments, mm. people using longer and drop mm. Is it possible when you do tournaments now, you specify? That your play cannot be this length, over on that, or or whatever. Well, so, <laughs> my main idea on that is that everyone should provide proof of three originals of equal weight and length and balance or whatever dimensions in a you know a small range. If at least three originals don't exist with those characteristics, you can't use it. So my, Sim so my, as simple as that. So my answer is, so in so, my perfect world, where half the population does HEMA, um, I would have different, I'd have different tournaments, I'd have um, different categories of rapier, and the weapons would be provided for the contestants or the fighters. Um, so that you might have a, you know, for the 1595 club guys, there would be a big heavy military rape, rapier class where they cut, you know, they can cut really from oh, yes. the They're heavier weapons, they can cut and they can thrust. And then there's the, then there's the kind of, the more, uh, shall we say, the more dueling rapier, 17th century, sort of English-Spanish, with the very long, narrow blades. There's a class for them, and their cuts don't do anything, or something like that, so you'd have different classes. I think one of the problems at the moment is you've just got one lump of rapier, and rapier is such a nebulous term that covers so many different types of sword. Really, what's a rapier? A fairly long sword with a complex yes. hilt? That's not always complex. It's kind of like, you know, what is it? It's, a, you know, it's more of a... You could say it's more of a style than a weapon, but then it's kind of not because no, some styles of, you know, Saviola is completely different to, yes. um, to Destreza. You In know? a matter of 50 years, also, yeah, it completely changes the way it's supposed to be used. Yeah, I mean, just totally, totally different. And, and, uh, and it doesn't even go by period as well. You know, you can take the middle of the 17th century and you can find early small sword. You know, you can find transitional rapier that's used basically like a small sword with only the point, pretty much. And then you can find Alfieri, and Alfieri, he teaches all the cuts, and he's doing something that's actually quite a bit like Sabre, actually. Yes. Um, so, um, yeah, so it's, it's very difficult, I think, with rapier. So what we do at the moment is just kind of like the best that we can manage for now. But I think longer term, if, if there are more people doing rapier, I think there should be different categories for different types of rapier. Yeah, that could be a really good solution. Um, rapier is... Yeah, too complex to define in one category. Long sword from that point of view is a lot easier. The swords are actually way closer to the regionals. And all long swords do more or less the same thing. They can all cut, they can all thrust. Yes. If you get hit with a long sword, you know it's going to be bad. Yes. Um. <laughs> and, and you can have fairly close replicas of, yeah. you know, blunt or, you know, feathers that are really close to the regionals without getting too heavy or yeah. too light. Or I mean, we do get changes. slightly into the area there, like, because of Feder, Federschwert or Parachwert, yes. whatever they were originally called, those things, 
you know, they were only used in the G Germanic influenced areas. There's no evidence of, really of them being used in Italy or England or no. France. France, the only really bit is the bit that's in contact with Germany. And Someone mentioned Italy about feathers in the far north, because, you know, but yeah, even for that, some parts. I've I've they been, were part of the Holy Roman Empire a few centuries before. And but I've, never, parts, I've but never seen any representation of what no, we would call a no, feather no. from Italy, what's now Italy, no. at all. Some people may have originals there because they have and maybe a German master at arms teaching there. Yeah. But yes, there but really is. It's what, in modern country terms, it's basically Germany, Austria, Poland, Czech Republic, Belgium, Netherlands. Yeah. That's it. And we don't see them outside that. So, but long swords were used outside, you know, obviously in Italy. It, if you're they in were Martin. very, yeah, exactly. Long swords were very popular. And in England, we've got, you know, long swords, we've got three texts that describe techniques with long swords. Probably more at the larger end of the spectrum, I think, rather than the type you'd wear. Um, so they were used in England, we know that they were used in France. Uh, Henry, Henry VIII was supposed to have a longsword bout with the King of France, was it Henry of France? I can't remember which King of Henry, which France it was. And um, they decided to not do it, because the, the quote is, because there's no gauntlets good enough to protect our hands, so let's just do wrestling and you know other stuff. Um, so, yeah, it's... Um, but no, you're right, that's a complete tangent. And long swords, it's easier to compare like with like rapiers, more difficult. Again, you get into the debate about side sword, because oh. what's a side sword? A side sword really is just a medieval one-handed sword. I, I, def I personally define side sword just the, the one-handed long sword. Even okay. Vadi really describes, you know, like if you're in town, don't mm. carry a long sword as to narrow streets, it's difficult to wield it, just carry a shorter one-ended sword, mm. which is basically the Bolognese side yeah. sword idea yeah. of school. I mean, I think that Marozzo wrote it at the end of the use of that sort of style and that sort well, yeah. of sword. Yeah. And, um, and people forget, people talk about, they think of Bolognese side sword as a 16th century thing, but uh, Marozzo himself was born in 1484. Exactly. And they're from the Dadi tradition, which started in the 1450s. And we already see swords that look exactly like this in art from about the 1420s, 1430s, yes, 1420s. from Spain and, yes. Spain and southern Italy. We have originals of that period, yeah. and they were already had that design, yeah. and yes, exactly. Well, the Alexandria one with one finger, oh, on, yes. which is a tight 19, 19 or yes. 20 bit, a very light blade. I mean, that weighs less than two pounds. It's less than a 19th century infantry officer's sabre. Yes. But with a 35 inch blade. So it's a very light blade, but good cutting and thrusting. Oh, yes. And that um, is the beginning of that style of sword. That is exactly. And that's 1415. So, I mean, that's, yes. yeah. And that is exactly what Vadi describes. You are in town, carry a shorter sword. Yeah. And that is what I describe as a side sword. When yeah. you first move from, you know. It's the sword you wear yes. inside the boat. But it, the term side sword is kind of modern, isn't it? It's oh yes, I mean, it's, but they, it's a good it's a good way to break it because that one was really used as a one-handed longsword, mm. lots of cards mm. for us. But it was in the same proportion as a longsword. Mm. The idea of the cards, the guards that you see in Marozzo too, and it is similar to what you see with a with a longsword. Mm. After it switched to more modern stances, you know, even even of here, it is more, more yes. From yeah. there, you, you for me, I start calling like early rapier, you know, middle rapier and late rapier. Yeah. You start getting lighter. And I think a gripper. I think a gripper, a gripper is one of the pivotal sources that oh, people yes. often say is maybe the first rapier source um, from 1550 or something, isn't it? Yes, exactly. And that is what I make the the, the distinction. I keep uh, but then the he's got of cuts and oh yes, only for the smaller, shorter, wider blades yeah. and. Which is, uh, you know, a result of social changes yeah. in society. It's no more, you know, uh, fiefdom. You don't have castles and, you know, mm. fields. You start having towns and merchants got richer. So you had to fight in the city. You want to be seen with your status symbols because it's not just for the rich guy, you know, the noble in the castle. So everything changes. So it starts being personal. And that's where you have the big, you know, um, split. So it started being military and civilian. Yeah. And they develop in very different way. Side sword is when is 
the very early idea of having your own sword at all time. Yeah, it's the beginning of that. It's and, the beginning laws, of this I mean, place. lots of parts of Europe, the laws actually, I won't say laws changed, but certain laws started to be ignored. So, for example, in England in the 15th century, unless you were a nobleman, you weren't allowed to walk around the city wearing a sword. Yeah. By the 16th century, no, they've forgotten about that law now. Yeah, you're allowed to walk around. So there was a, there was a cultural shift yes. um, at the end of the 15th century where people went from wearing a dagger to wearing a sword. Oh, yes, so. exactly. And also the use got, you know, changed to, you know, towards what is the environment you have to use it in. Mm. Especially, you know, Italian Renaissance towns, very narrow lanes and streets. So yeah. can you actually swing it well? Mm. Mm, thrust it, it's a lot easier in an outer <laughs> space and I think that everything goes together um, you need something that you know is good to use in those environments you want to go a little bit more on the thrust so but for thrusting something longer could be actually better because you keep a longer distance well or, or if you're if you know that obviously the duel is a big because if you're now you're fighting one on one that's a very different context to I'm in now like a melee oh, God, or fighting numerous of people. And you know, Vardy says, if you're fighting numerous people, only cuts, don't thrust. Oh, yes. Yeah, of course, if, if people are coming from all directions, you're doing this. But if you're fighting one person, then oh, that course. makes more sense. Yes, you know, one versus one, the rapier is the most efficient weapon. But as soon as you have to face two opponents, you're probably dying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I, despite the fact I'm not a rapierist, I've always been very kind of one-on-one. -on -one. Yes, rapier was the natural kind of, the, the apex, I think, yes. of the one-on-one. -on -one. But it, rapier in a, in a multiple opponent situation, I, then I turn my attention oh, to long swords no. and montantes and things like this. We, so. we, we, we tried once to do an eight versus eight with rapier, and the longest boat would last the light. One minute ten. Because <laughs> as soon as the first one dies, the other double up. And yeah, yeah, it, it yeah. just piles up and quickly everyone yeah. dies. So, so two questions I think to finish up um, that I've got for you personally, but you're also welcome to stick your hand up if you've got any other questions. Um, so number one, you put nuts on most of your swords. I just yes. want to know your thinking behind that. Not that I'm against nuts, but oh, just, no, no. And, and, this, and the second one is a sort of fairly general question, but just to ask what, where, what next, kind of for, for Danelli Armoury, what, what do you see next is there? Right, uh, the nut question, uh, sounds bad. <laughs> the nut question, yeah, tell us about your nuts. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, as I say, I've been started with rapiers. It doesn't make much of a difference. Even the originals had, you know, pinion blocks, so mm -hmm. they protruded out of the pommel as a small nut. Mm -hmm. And having a nut allows you to change the blade more easily, especially with the rapier, where the hilt is complex and pricey. Mm -hmm. And sometimes grips are more, you know, elaborate. So if you snap a blade, you don't want to be bashing and hammering things out. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier to just remove that and put it back on so that's why you have it you know is there is no drawback into having a, a rapier held with a you know with a nut or with a threaded pommel mm. um, but then I lied the practicality of the thing so I kept doing that also for long sword uh, the idea is that if you just destroy the hilt you can just change it I can just ship to customers just that if mm. you break the blade or it gets too mangled or whatever I can just ship you our new blade. You don't need to change the entire thing. Mm -hmm. uh, people get hit sometimes on the grip, which is wood. It, mm -hmm. It's not going to resist too to, to much bashing. You can just remove everything and just change the grip. There is no glue under it, mm -hmm. and which makes the entire process, for me, actually way more complicated because all tolerances have to be smaller, otherwise it rattles, it moves, and it doesn't hold steady. And you have to put a thread on that. <coughs> In yes. some ways, peening, the, peening would be easier. Oh, yes, absolutely. But people always have their option. Mm. Remove the nuts, hammer it, that's all you have to do. <laughs> yeah, it, so, yeah. You don't need really... You, you know, might have to soften it a knee a little bit before. It has threads, yeah. so it's already soft. Oh, okay. And also we soften it, all the tunnels are softened afterwards. Oh, really? Yes, oh, otherwise they, they are prone to snap too easily. Ah, so you kneel with tangs after the... Tangs and yeah. up to like, you know, an inch into oh. above the shoulders, because oh, okay. it's basically impossible to bend the blade there because it's not it's eight, you know, not six eight or whatever mm. you know it's the thickest is the strongest it's not gonna bend it may snap if it's too hard mm. that's why he treatment on the entire blade and then we just beat and kneel i've seen other, soften that yeah, i've part. seen other makes of swords where the pommel snapped off with the tank still inside it so yes. that's, people don't realize how much 
pressure actually. Oh yes, that, that also may happen. Uh, we had a few issues with that because uh, when it started, I wasn't really kneeling the entire tank, and a few snapped in that spot. Mm. Now we try to pay more attention to that. Yeah. Also, we need to reheat the tank because we are burning the grapes. Because given that I have no glue under it, they have to have a perfectly Fair tight piece. fit. So the hole is smaller. Right. Then they're burned so you, onto the. Do you drill a hole through first and then? Yes, or the shape it. You know, in the case of a long so you need to pre-shape it almost to to the shape. Oh, but you just leave a few mil on each side. You just burn it onto it, oh. and so it's a perfectly tight fit. Otherwise, with a screw pommel, it will move or it will start cracking more easily if it has a little bit of movement. So that's what I mean. It it, it is actually a lot, a lot more work to, to make it, you know, a nice tight fit. And what what type of wood are you using for the grips? It, uh, general hardwood. Mm -hmm. uh, when I try, when, when I find oak, I use that. Mm -hmm. Classic depends. Uh, if you're talking about a custom or a one of the entry levels, you know, it's different. So various different right? woods and what's, yes, know, what's yes. available, hardwoods. So, yeah, okay. I try to use a little bit of both and um, what to expect from the company in itself for the future is probably definitely a lot more sharps. Really? Yes. So you've, you've resigned yourself to that fate? Yes. <laughs> is, well, a sharp is a weapon mm. and you're giving it to someone you do not know. Mm. Legally, ethically, there, are, there is a lot going on in there. But the highest of the market is for sharps, and as a personally, as a maker, I want to be pushed to my limits to do what I can do. I want to learn new things. I want to be forced to to go back into struggle and to understand how to do something and to put put hours into making smaller details. I want to give my hundred percent, and to do that, I now need to be making you know high end replicas, yeah. and those happen only mostly for sharps. Right. Uh, I'm not saying that I covered it all for Hema Swords, but I'm almost there. Really? really? Well, I've made most of the models, and what is left, as, as after you can make a Type 2 Biscavona, you reach the top of what you can do as <laughs> shaping. There is nothing more complicated than that. Mm. And I've made one. Right. Which I thought would have been like the, you know, the apex of my career. At some point, one day, it actually happened way too soon. So for you personally, you're looking for challenges. You're looking for the next thing to, to sort of push yourself to, rather than just... Yes, it's really hard to keep motivation in a craft, in what is supposed to be your passion. Mm. You turn your hobby, your passion, into your job, and you think it's going to be amazing. Yeah. But when you have to redo the same rapier for the you know, 15th time, mm. it's a little bit... So you've got an apprentice. Yes. Do you Actually, think that's, that's something that might expand? Do you think you might Chris get more people? is too good to be called an apprentice now. He's been with me four years. And right. Yes, and he focused greatly mostly on blades. So he is really, really good. He's a full, you know, bladesmith. Yeah. And um, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm probably, as I say, going to slowly move towards um, personally handmade, higher-end things. I will keep making, you know, HEMA customs, but I can, it can't be just that. Mm. It's too, too, too mundane after a while. I know it sounds bad, because for each person, no, that is so, it's beautiful. It's just that I've done already a few of those or something similar, and I feel the need to be pushed to, yeah. do, to do something more complicated. I want to keep growing. I could settle here. I'm good at what I do. I got plenty of orders, can you know earn enough to live my life. And once you settle there, but I'm I'm a craftsman. I, I want to learn more, I want to be pushed to have to do more. And it seems like counterintuitive that you want to struggle, but that's what I want. I want to, to expand what I can do. Um, I'm not that great with leather work because I love rapiers, so yeah. Usually uh, there is no leather work at all, if not for this kind of <laughs> Okay, well, let's wrap it up there. We've been talking about a long time, but no, no, that's absolutely fantastic, Marco. Thank you very much. And please give Marco a round of applause. Thank you.